So I'm going, the way that I'll structure this part of the program is we'll start with some introductions and then I wanted to thank everybody who took a chance or took an opportunity to submit questions in advance for the panelists. We'll start with three of those questions and then from there we'll have plenty of time to move into your questions. Um, so. I will just give an introduction of your name department and where you've landed a job and then the first question we'll ask you to elaborate a bit more on that. Um, so our first panelist here is Cecilia Wu. She is from Media Arts and Technology and has landed a job at the University of Colorado Denver. Our next panelist is Lucas Bang from the Computer Science Department and he has landed a job at Har Harvey Mudd College. And our final panelist is Alex Miller from the Department of Physics who has landed a job at Wellesleyan, if I've said that correctly. Wellesley. Wellesley, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, so I think we will start with kind of a broad question where I'm going to ask each of you to tell us a bit about your job search. How many institutions did you apply to? How many interviews did you get? And to what extent did you customize all of those applications? And let's just go ahead and start with Cecilia. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Lisa and Mindy. And uh, so basically, um, our field is uh, kind of a uh, you know, not have much job opening. So basically I apply for whatever that's um, on the market. That's, I counted since you asked the question, there's only like 12 opening this year. So it's very, so I apply for whatever there. Uh, <laughs> um, so, and so what is the next one? And is how many interviews you get, you right. got, and then to what extent did you customize those 12 applications? Right. Um, so basically, uh, I, you know, I didn't customize this unless, you know, there's really a good match because they ask all very similar things. But for, um, I, I got four uh, on-campus interview. Um, and uh, so got uh, you know to offer. So um, I guess that um, um, so the the four are also the the, the interviews that totally I got. So um, I think uh, for the one that I got the job that I got I customized it a little bit because um, they also it's a kind of a music and entertainment. Uh, industry studies. So they also, uh, besides the academic research and artistic work, they also uh, wanted to have a connection with the industry. So uh, that's a little bit special. Um, so I customized that and also the Berkeley Music College at Boston. So both of those two I got, um, you know, the on-campus interview. So I kind of uh, customized a little bit. Uh, yeah, I guess I'll go next. So, yeah, I applied to uh, 29 places, and I guess I kind of had a, a different experience because it seems like in computer science, every single computer science department everywhere is hiring. So, uh, yeah, I kind of had to decide where to apply. Uh, yeah, so I applied to 29. Uh, I had 16 phone interviews. And then out of those, I got invited for 14 campus visits. Wow. <laughs> okay. And then uh, I decided to go on eight of them. But then I actually only ended up going to five. Because uh, after five, I was like getting really burned out. <laughs> and uh, by then, I had gotten an offer, and I needed to respond. So Harvey Mudd had made me an offer, and I just decided that was my top choice. Uh, so I decided to take it, and I canceled all the rest of my interviews. So. <laughs> Uh, that's how that went down. Um, then, in terms of uh, customizing my application, well, uh, it's kind of like I didn't really tailor my application to every place, but you know, different places had different requirements. Like, uh, you know, like maybe one place asks for a one-page teaching statement and a one-page diversity statement. But another place asks for a teaching statement, which addresses diversity, you know? So I would kind of try to write my statements so that I could kind of cut pieces out and piece them back together, you know, as necessary. So yeah, that's kind of my level of customization. 
So I, similarly, I applied to 30 places. <clears throat> but so I applied to a large spectrum. So I applied to several, for instance, community colleges. Um, I just really, going into it, I wasn't sure like how competitive I was going to be. Or I had heard that really for physics positions, like even at places, institutions that were more teaching focused, that a lot of times they still wanted you to do a postdoc, and they weren't going to hire you out of your PhD. Um, but then I learned something magical, which was about visiting assistant professor positions, which they have at liberal arts colleges. And so I applied to primarily these visiting um, positions and community colleges. And surprisingly, I had a much higher, I think, all of the visiting positions at liberal arts colleges contacted me for interviews, whereas uh, I only heard back from a few of the community colleges, and I don't know if that's just there's more people applying for those positions. Um, but so I ended up, I ended up interviewing, I think, with nine places, um, not on-site, at least just phone interviews. Um, I think I went to five on-site interviews. Um, but it's amazing. I still actually, literally yesterday, I got a call from another place asking me for an interview, and I was just was like, well, it's too late now. Um, <laughs> uh, and I should say that the, it was a little bit madness because I, I applied to all of these places and I was getting stressed because I wasn't hearing back. And then suddenly it was just like a huge wave of places contacting me, wanting me, and they're like, you have to come for an interview on exactly this day. And I had like two weeks where I literally, I traveled from Santa Barbara to Seattle to Massachusetts, back to San Francisco, back to Maine, back to Santa Barbara, and it was the craziest two weeks of my life. So be prepared for that. Because uh, it happened all of a sudden, and it's not like they all contact you and give you a lot of time to think about scheduling it so you can schedule things nicely. You like hear back at different times, and so you're just like, well, I guess I'll fit you in this window. I don't know. Um, but at the end of the day, I was fortunate, like Lucas, which is that Wellesley was actually the first school that, con that made me an offer, and they were my first choice. So it made it a really easy decision. Um, and then I, I did end up, there were a couple other schools who were still really pushing for me, and one was like, still made me an offer, even though I told them that I got the Wellesley offer and probably wasn't going to accept their offer. Um, but I feel like, I mean, so I, I think I was really fortunate in that. I could imagine things having gone differently where you get an offer from a place that's not your top choice first, and that would have been more challenging. But. Okay, well, very um, inspiring. It <laughs> makes me very hopeful for everyone yeah. in the audience answers. Um, so to follow on on that success that all of you have experienced, what, may, what do you think made your application stand out or made you stand out? among other candidates for these positions? Um, so I think, um, you know, thinking back of, uh, you know, I guess that they like you as a person. Uh, that's, that's, that's what I'm thinking, that why they would choose me, because, um, you know, I, I, I'm pretty sure that they have very, very competent um, uh, you know, candidates, and I know that, you know, I met a few um, composers and, you know, they are very, very good composers at the conference. They said, okay, I, I applied that job too. They are very good. So I think what they like me is um, they asked me a question about what do you think, why you're standing out from the rest of the, 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 the people? And I think I, I told them that I wanted to be modest. I wanted to be humble. So that's what I'm saying. And just, you know, sometimes I think, uh, you know, they probably already know how good you are because <laughs> you have your CV and all of those. Um, but they really want to have a colleague that is nice and, you know, can work with for a long period of time. Um, yeah, I guess I guess that was the the key for me. Uh, yeah, for me, I think definitely one of the things that made my application application stand out, which people mentioned to me when I went to interviews, was like being involved in like these you know sort of teaching development activities like mm -hmm. STIA and CCUT and like having taken the course with Lisa. Uh, you know, then you know this comes through when you write your teaching statement because then you can write about things like. Uh, active learning and all that stuff, and it sounds legit. I mean, and it is legit. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, but 
it, but it sounds like you know what you're talking about, and you do, so you know it, it comes through in your application. So I think that definitely helped me. Um, another thing was that uh, at first, I really had a hard time writing my research statement. I like really struggled with it. And it was so boring and dry. I, just, I don't know. I didn't even like reading it. And you know, this is the stuff I've been working on for years. And so at some point, I decided, like, OK, I'm just going to write this weird research statement about linguistic relativity, which is not what I study at all. <laughs> And uh, apparently, this stood out to the computer scientists because they thought, like, oh well, here's somebody who is, you know, interested in computer science, but also interested in other stuff. And I think this kind of fit in well with like a liberal arts teaching-focused college. So, kind of writing something a little like off-center of the standard computer science research statement uh, helped me out. I think. Yeah. Sorry, I just have a quick question. Um, with that. Research statements, something that you were saying is something you're just pursuing in the future? Yeah, so what it was was I wrote like a one page thing about this topic, linguistic relativity, which I just think is personally interesting, but I don't do research in it. And I related it to what my research is. Okay. And then the next four pages were the rest of that dry, boring stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but at least the intro stood out as something that was compelling and different from what other people were writing, I think. Okay. Yeah. So I 100% second Lucas in that um, I think one of the things that they even mentioned stood out was that I had participated in CCAT and Dunstia and exactly like writing, both writing my teaching philosophy statement and answering questions at interviews. Like yeah. I highly recommend Lisa's class because uh, it was great because I just felt like it wasn't, it just wasn't hard. I just knew, I, you know, I knew my stuff. So it was really easy to talk to them and I think Again, comparing, since I had also applied to a lot of um, community colleges and liberal arts colleges, I think to the community colleges who had a lot of people who only have master's degrees applying, but maybe have a lot more teaching experience. So they were like, oh, this person doesn't have enough, enough teaching experience. Where the, whereas the liberal arts colleges were like, you taught a class already? That's crazy. That's amazing. You've done so much. <laughs> um, so I think having that experience of actually you know, having taught a class here at UCSB and again participating in the professional development, I think was probably the biggest thing. Great, and I'll just use that opportunity to make a shameless plug for our materials <laughs> outside at the table if you want to learn more about CCUT or STIA and the classes called Grad 210. I'm not sure when it'll be offered, but it will be offered again next year. Um, so we have one more question that was submitted and then we'll move into the open Q&A. So the last question that I'd like to ask you, it's kind of a fun one. What was the best and worst advice you got about securing a faculty position in higher ed? And let's start at the other end this time. All oh, right. Oh, the be I have to think about this one for a second. The best and worst advice that I got. Um, so the best advice was maybe advice that I should have remembered and taken into account more. So um, I had. Well, I guess two answers. Okay, um, the first one was that to be prepared for the interviews. So as I said, um, the sudden wave of interviews was madness, and I was told that it would be this way, and I was told that, um, and this fortunately it was okay for me, was that um, financially you might be a little strained when you suddenly have these interviews, because a lot of places you have to pay for your own flight, and then they'll reimburse you. But if you suddenly are flying all over the country and you don't have a, you know, a credit card with a high limit or you just don't have a lot of money saved up, um, that can really be a strain. So I remember, so that ended up being fine, but in general, um, maybe I just was being too shy and didn't think I was going to get as many responses, but just being prepared for like the sudden wave of interviews that you hopefully get, um, that was some advice that I had gotten that I, yeah, sh should have been ready for then. <laughs> I should have known. Um, I don't know what the worst advice is. Maybe, maybe we should go on and I'll come back and think about it. Yeah, yeah. so I'll definitely second that. Uh, be yeah. prepared to spend money yeah. on flying somewhere. I'm still waiting on reimbursements. Yeah, some me places. too. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's definitely an issue that I didn't expect. Um, 
Yeah, so I think one of the best things that somebody told me was to prepare notes, which I still do, uh, for stuff like this or uh, like phone interviews. So um, yeah, like I you know, had this whole list of like a script basically for my phone interviews. So what to say when they ask, you know, what active learning techniques do you use in the classroom? It's like, okay, here they are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just on the phone, and so they don't know you're reading off a script. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, and then have a set of questions like, you know, what are you going to ask them when they say, do you have any questions for us? You, know, you don't want to be one. like, oh no, I don't know. Uh, definitely, so, definitely do that. Yeah, definitely have do that. some. Have like 15 questions ready to go to, you know, keep Ooh. the conversation going because. <laughs> I mean, yeah, like when it comes down to it, it's really about a lot of it has to do with how you interact with the people that are interviewing you and you want to be able to continue the conversation and keep talking and you know, not have dead time. It's, it's kind of hard. It can be difficult. So if you prepare some <coughs> material ahead of time, uh, I don't know, for me, it was more comfortable. Um, yeah, and the other advice that I think is really good is to start really early. So I thought I started early and it still wasn't early enough. Like, I don't know, I started in the summertime for that fall's uh, application season, and I still felt like I was, you know, scrambling to get things done. So, I mean, start as early as you can. Uh, and then, I think the, not really bad advice, but, uh, I don't know, the advice that I didn't find useful was lots of people told me to just apply to as many places as you possibly can. And uh, I don't know, that didn't really work out well for me. I just kind of started to feel like at the end, I was kind of spread thin and not really paying attention. And uh, at some point, I even accidentally submitted an application to the wrong place. You know? <laughs> so yeah, it worked out. It was fine. It was no problem. I emailed them immediately and said, you know, my bad. Here's my actual application. But uh, yeah, I think I would have been better off focusing on like the 10 places that I really wanted to go to rather than you know, 30. So. I again second all of that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, um, so I think the question was uh, the uh, advice I got. Yeah. So, um, I think uh, I didn't ask a lot of people of advice, um, but I did ask my uh, mentors um, who can give me ver like they are faculty at Stanford and our USSB. Um, you know they are very experienced. They're on the committee uh, for decades. So I ask them the advice. They are all very good. So um, I think from my own experience, um, it's, it's very important to. Um, manage your time during the interview. So, um, you know, because these two um, 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 colleagues already talk about the, the rest, but I think for me, uh, my experience, I, I got a, my first interview, I missed my uh, uh, lecture time. So <laughs> that was like I was uh, talking to the students. Um, and then I thought that because in our department, um, there would be someone to uh, remind the candidate and say, OK, we're going to move to the next um, session. But they didn't do that. And I was thinking, you know, I was just uh, very nervous and did the recording in the morning. I was, uh, I didn't pay attention to the time and I actually missed my lecture time. So that didn't go very well. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, and so for the next one, I, I really make, you know, my Google Calendar every time before 10 minutes, there will be an alarm. So, <laughs> yeah, so that would be something. Keep in mind. Okay, thank you all. So I want to go ahead and move around the room and we will demand that you use the mic. <laughs> so I guess in regards to liberal arts schools, where did you find the best kind of search engines? I have, I've heard that there are some really good Facebook groups for that. I've heard, you know, Indeed, HigherEd.com. Um, kind of where should we be targeting uh, where we start searching for these kinds of positions? Yeah, I mean, so I had several websites that I was going, and one of the one of the easiest things to do is a lot of these websites you can set up um, for them to send you like weekly or periodic emails with with recent postings. So Higher Ed Jobs, Chronicle of Ute. Um, uh, what other ones are there? Yeah, so yeah, I used Higher Ed Jobs. Uh, in computer science, there's a website called CRA, 
which lists all the computer science jobs, so that was useful for me. Uh, and then, uh, if you're interested in applying to Cal State schools, the Cal State application system is pretty uniform, and they have like a website where basically you can access all of the jobs in the Cal State system from one place. So, and then you can apply to all of them with pretty similar materials. So, I took advantage of that. So, um, I guess our field is uh, it's, it's a little bit different because we don't have much uh, openings. So, um, but always like if you have a network that they have uh, like a in circle list, like mailing list, they will si send out those information. So that's, um, you know, you will get that information before they even post it, for example, at anywhere else. Um, but I also, because I started late, actually, I didn't thought that I'm going to um, apply this year. I thought I'm going to do a postdoc or something. Um, so, but during the Thomas fire, I was stuck at home and cannot go anywhere. <laughs> so, I, so I think, okay, so I don't have any grading, you know, because that uh, final was canceled. So I, <laughs> so I, so I just have a plenty of time. So um, that's why I applied this year. So, um, but I think um, there's also the linking is very nice because they will keep sending you, um, sending you kind of a reminder, um, and also the the higher ad that is also basically I just depends on the in circle uh, mailing list, and uh, LinkedIn and higher ad. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to go back and then. Uh, so there's a question for Alexandra because you mentioned uh, visiting assistant professor. Could you expand a little bit about that? And is it a full-time position? Is there security of employment? Things like that. Yeah. So these are great positions. So they're almost like teaching postdocs um, in that. So they're temporary. So you find usually they range from one to three years. And I was actually advised against one-year position. So they're full-time. So you go there and you're basically a faculty member for you know, X amount of years. And um, they're a really great way just to get into the liberal arts system without, I mean, a lot of liberal arts colleges still don't want to apply, you know, hire you right out of your PhD. But if you don't, if research isn't really what you want to do, if your heart is really with teaching, then this is a really great option. Um, yeah, so I was advised not to accept a one year position just because then you're there for a couple months and you're applying to jobs again. However, Wellesley was a one-year position and they gave me the offer and then I told them, no, give me two years, and then they did. So, um, so it's probably still worth it to apply to the one-year positions, but I think they're great. They're, yeah, it's full-time. Um, I know there's a woman who's a professor, well, so she was a visiting professor at Wellesley who ended up, it kept being extended to four years and now she just got promoted to a continuing job. So, um, yeah. Hi, uh, thank you so much for doing this. This is amazing. And I just wanted to ask, um, what were some of the questions that, that faculty uh, asked you in these job talks or interviews that you weren't prepared for? I had one that really tripped me up, which was a standard type question. So they asked, there was one where they asked me, um, it was like, if you're working in a team and there's some, like what's an experience where you had where you were working in a team and there was some conflict that you had and how did you resolve the conflict? And I feel like that's a stand, there were a couple, there, I feel like there was one other one like that where it was like a standard interview question that I wasn't as prepared for because I was more prepared for like one specifically related to teaching, like all the ones specifically related to like teaching philosophy and diversity I was all prepared for, but all of these sort of more like I don't know, standard type interview questions I wasn't as prepared for. I should say I got more of those at community colleges though than at the liberal arts colleges. The liberal arts colleges still seem to stick to like more, I don't know, other types of questions it seemed like. Yeah, so I had a, at one of my interviews, I was uh, yeah, sitting in a room and suddenly somebody came in and they were like, hey, I'm from a tutoring center and as part of your interview, we're going to suddenly role play a one-on-one uh, -on -one teaching situation. Wow. Yeah. 
<laughs> which I was not prepared for at all. They didn't tell me that was going to happen. And so then I just kind of had to wing it. And it went, it went well, but I, I wasn't prepared for it. So it threw me off. Um, so before I answer this question, I just recall something that's very important. I think uh, that made me standing out was, um, you know, um, actually I take notes when they are asking me questions. Um, so I try to remember all the committee members' names so I can write them back a thank you note, so to include everyone. So I try very hard to search their email. It's not very easy sometimes. They just say, hey, this is Professor X and Y. So I think it's very important that you can write down when they're asking your question, you should write down something to show that you're very serious and very, you know, paying attention and, you know, be respectful. Okay, that was it. Um, um, what is the question? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what was the question that stumped you during the interview? Yeah, so I think there was one interview that they were um, asking me, what is my research focus? Um, I actually, because um, I was in the interdisciplinary research, so I did a lot of different things. Um, but I guess that for those R1 university, they kind of a little bit confused. Uh, when you're doing a lot of things. So they wanted to know my main focus, uh, what is the future research. Um, that I actually, I think I can go to different routes. It depends on where they need me to. Um, but I guess that if you are applying for R1 university, um, you might really want to think about this question. Yeah. Thank you. Here. Uh, my question has to do with kind of timing and, and you know you mentioned they all came at once but like when in the year quarter like was it in like January was it in October like when was the kind of timeline on interviewing and things like that? Uh, for me I finished all of my most of my applications by like around the beginning of December and then I didn't really hear anything for a while I think everyone went on winter break and I don't know wasn't looking at applications and then, yeah, suddenly, around like middle of January, it was like one after another for a couple weeks. And then they want you to schedule interviews and phone interviews and campus visits. So yeah, from like middle of January till middle of March was just like constant emails, phone calls, traveling, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, so I think I missed the boat a little bit because I think similarly, I had applied to postdocs. Um, originally, because I wasn't really sure what I, well, actually I knew I wanted to go towards a teaching job, but I thought that maybe I needed to do a postdoc. So I applied to postdocs, so I didn't start looking until January, and I think that's part of why, so they actually, at Wellesley, hired, I'm so sad, a full-time tenure track physicist right out of her PhD, and I'm like, that could have been me, but I hadn't seen, I wasn't applying at the time when they had posted that. So I think I should have started like Lucas did much earlier, and by the time, so I started looking at teaching positions, like in, I started looking in January. So at that time, it was only these visiting type positions that remained. Hi, just a quick question. So uh, you applied to postdocs and teaching positions in liberal arts. Did you tailor your CV differently for different types of jobs, and what did you include or not include in those? I did tailor mine differently, um, partly because, so for instance, on my, um, the one for teaching positions, just because I know it's non-experts who are going to be looking at it, more likely, so I included more things like a more layman's term description of my research, like I had a little statement about that. Um, and I, or I ordered things differently, just so different things would, they would notice different things first. I should also say the community colleges asked for resumes instead of CVs. So that was, so resumes, you know, are quite a bit shorter. And there, I mean, there's a few different things that are different about them. Um, so I had a, a postdoc CV, a teaching focused institution CV, and a, a resume. And they were all a little bit different. Yeah, I kind of did a similar thing, I guess, but mostly I just, like you said, reordered stuff. Like if it was a teaching focus position, put the teaching at the top. If it was a research position, put the research at the top. That was really the only difference. Otherwise, the content was all exactly the same for me. Um, so go back to our C-cut. So it's a very, very good um, 
opportunity to help you because if you wanted to get the certificate, you need to write your philosophy, uh, whatever that needs to be done. So I have already got that done a year ago, so I don't really need to write those. Um, and the, divert, the, the diversity um, statement, I was, um, you know, I was the diversity fellow at UCSB. Um, so that was uh, handy too. So basically, I would uh, uh, recommend that you apply for all the fellowship or grant funding that's there because you can reuse those um, whatever that you have already written. And then that's also kind of at your merit. So it will make you more competent. So, yeah. <coughs> Um, so a few of you mentioned that um, you basically got applications from your first choice early on. Did you do anything during the interview to indicate to them that they were a top or your first choice? Yeah, I should say the way I talked to different institutions was very different. And the amount of information I chose to share with them was different. Like I didn't want to tell, I don't know if this is the right thing to do, but when I was, for instance, interviewing at a community college, I wasn't like, well, next I'm going to interview at Wellesley after this, because then I was scared that they would be like, oh, well, she's not serious. But I wanted, I mean, I would. I think I would have been happy at a community college, so like I, I was serious and I didn't want them to be deceived. Whereas Wellesley, I was much more like, well, I have an interview at Bates later. <laughs> um, so, T times, you know, the clock is ticking. So I did, I did share different information with different institutions. Yeah, I kind of did the same, <laughs> uh, you know. But, you know, the, the top two places that I had, I, not, not really during the interview, but afterwards, you know, I emailed the chair and, uh, you know, whoever was leading the search committee and said, you know, I'm really impressed and I'm really interested in the position. It's like one of my top choices, you know, please, you know, keep me in the loop and let's keep in touch, you know, those kind of things. So I did indicate that I was very interested in the positions that I, that I liked. Yeah, I should say I did also, so I think all three of us now have mentioned sending like thank you emails or like email, follow up emails and I think that was really good. And I did actually, I should say, I did also tell Wellesley they were my top choice, so. Because um, we only have so um, few openings, so I take very seriously to every um, opportunity. So basically, I think you should go, you know, go all the way to 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 show like you really care about this. That's probably specifically would be hold true in the humanity and arts and also something like that. So you want them to know that you really uh, you're really interested in that position and you have a future, you know, considered with that uh, institution. Um, but I didn't tell them that I they are my first choice unless uh, until they 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 give me an offer. So when they give me a uh, uh, give me the offer, that was my first choice. The the university that I I am now um, signed a contract with, they are my first choice. So I told them that that's my first choice. So they know that I have other choices. So um, yeah. So basically, I don't want it to. They feel like I'm very kind of uh, too, like, you know, sometimes you have to be careful about your attitude and, you know, make sure that, you know, you're not annoying people. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So my question, I don't know if you can actually speak on this, but um, out of your departments, do you know how many other people are finishing this year and what the placement rate for academic jobs was for those individuals just gen generally? Hmm. In my department, I knew personally of five people who went to get academic jobs and all of them got one, as far as I know. Wow. So, <laughs> but most people in my department, in my field, end up going you know, Silicon Valley or whatever, and don't go to academia, so it's kind of different. I think out of my cohort, there's maybe, there's like 15 to 20 of us who are finishing this year. I think I was the only one who applied to teaching jobs like this, though. Most of the rest of them applied to postdocs, and I think in terms of receiving postdocs, similarly, I think everyone who wanted a postdoc managed to get, to get one. Um, 
Yeah, I hope that our <laughs> field is that popular. Um, but unfortunately, it's, um, it's, it's not like as uh, like they are so um, popular. Um, <laughs> so what I've known, not for our department, but I've, uh, I've learned that from my friends from Stanford University, actually, they are very, very good uh, researchers uh, that's graduating at Stanford University and didn't land a job. So, um, so yeah. Like there's a lot of Sorry. questions up front. <laughs> Thank you all for this panel. I was wondering if you had any tips for the negotiation process when you actually get the offer. Hmm. I don't have any tips for that because I didn't really negotiate. I just, <laughs> as soon as I got the offer from my top school, I said, yeah, sure, I'll take it. So I, I received some tips that I ended up, I'm not sure if I, because my position is this visiting position, I got the feeling it was a little more um, set in stone, although I did get them to up it to two years, and that actually was accidental. It's because Bates kept contacting me and trying to get me to come to them, and I was like, well, Wellesley, Bates is offering me three years, and they really want me to come interview with them. Um, so I didn't, I actually wasn't trying to play hard to get. It was just sincerely like, I'm ser it's seriously making me have a hard time decide. And then actually Wellesley responded, because that was my biggest hang up was like, a one year position, even though you're telling me it probably will get extended, I'm gonna be so upset if I have to apply to jobs again in less than a year. Um, but I've heard, I've been told that a standard, if they give you an offer, a standard rebuttal is 20% higher. But I didn't actually, in terms of salary. But I didn't actually do that. But that's what I've that's what I've told. Not that you expect to actually get 20% higher. But but I was at a panel like this, and someone told me that once. <laughs> we'll have to follow up with the faculty panel on that uh, next and <laughs> see what they say. Did you negotiate, Cecilia? Is there a faculty panel today? Yeah, right after this one, we'll have faculty oh, members. I, uh, listen, uh, yeah, actually, I have, <laughs> I have no experience in negotiating, um, um, and it's so. But as you know, there's very few tenure track position there. Um, besides, they give me a, you know, I because they are kind of uh, the government, so it's like the University of Colorado. So you can actually check their salary online. So when they give me the offer, and then I check, you know, all the faculties, um, you know, and I feel like they give me a pretty good deal. So um, so I think I should be. You know, I should not be too too hard to get. Um, you know, maybe they have other choices. Um, but I did. I think if you need something for your lab, for example, you have to have it um, to continue your research and be succeed. Uh, and to succeed in your career, you need to ask those. So um, there's a lot of other things, uh, you know, other than salary that you can negotiate, uh, your lab uh, equipment, um, how many courses. Like there is one thing that, um, you know, there's a course release actually, you know, um, you, they offer you, they offer me a course release, but before they offered that to me, I, I didn't know there is a course release. So maybe you, um, so after that I did a lot of uh, online search and I think that if you have a partner um, that you can also you know negotiate for the special um, job and course release or like a, a sabbatical for a quarter or something like that so um, yeah make sure that you check uh, your salary standard comparing to but if you're like a private uh, school that probably a little bit harder but you can always go to the what's that called the glass door Mm -hmm. um, and track those so to make sure that you're not asking something they cannot affo uh, afford. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I came a little bit late. I don't know if you covered this topic, but I wanted to talk about the networking that you did to land the job. So there's one thing that you apply your CV, your application, and then you knowing someone in that uh, recruiting place to get you. So did you, like when you got recruited, did you know someone in that uh, institute? Because for me, when I landed here and like I got three other uh, 
offers as a postdoc, it wasn't because I applied for applications. It was just because of networking. I knew someone. Mm -hmm. So did you have this kind of uh, experience? <laughs> okay. um, actually, no, because uh, other people also ask me because the you know there's a composer didn't get a job. He asked me, "Do you know anyone there?" <laughs> um, but actually, I didn't know anyone there. Um, so, but I think network is very important in terms of you know um, you know your reputation in this field because they might you know I, I later I know that our dean actually. Uh, worked uh, in the past in the other university, which uh, he also hired the other uh, assistant professor at that institution who is my previous teacher. So that kind of thing, so you, you wanted to be like, uh, uh, maintain a good reputation uh, in the long term, not just, you know, doing that networking, you know, before you get your job or something like that, yeah. Okay. So I actually also didn't know anyone at Wellesley, although I did, so some other places I had, so I, I, I researched the different professors at different institutions. So for instance, there's a woman at Smith where I also interviewed who used to be a physics, who got her PhD here and then went to Wellesley and then went to Smith. And so I like emailed her and I was like, oh, you worked with Matthew Fisher. And so even though Wellesley, I didn't know anyone, I did try to use my network in other institutions. I should also say, um, even though, so not addressing knowing people at, at those institutions, one area that networking really helped me was knowing people here. So knowing Lisa and Mindy, who wrote me letters of recommendation. <laughs> um, because one thing that's really hard that maybe you won't think about is, so, I mean, doing a PhD, you do research, your research advisor, advisor knows you really well, and maybe you have some collaborators who know you really well. But one thing that I think some people who I've known who are applying for these jobs struggle with are um, having people who know about your teaching. So if you're applying for a teaching focused position, um, growing your network so there are people who know about your ability to teach is really important and might be especially helpful in getting a letter of recommendation because because I, I have friends who are applying for teaching jobs and they're like, well, I have people who can write about my research, but, but they really want at least one person who can speak to your teaching abilities. Yeah, so for me, uh, kind of the same. I didn't really actively have like networking going on, but then it kind of would accidentally turn out pretty much everywhere I went that somebody would know somebody that I knew from my department. And you know, this was useful and helpful and you know, basically, there, there's somebody who can vouch for you. So, but I didn't, you know, try to network my way into a job or anything. But yeah, definitely knowing people that can talk about your teaching as well, like you said, is, you know, helpful because your advisor knows all about your research, but you know, somebody like Lisa knows about your teaching. So. How much did they seem to care about your TAing, evaluations, ESCIs? You said they care about your teaching experience, but what about TAing? Uh, yeah, so I think TA experiences, I mean, for me, uh, was helpful. Like, being able to talk about my experiences as a TA was, you know, relevant to my teaching experience. And basically, I think every, no, not every place, lots of the places I applied to wanted my, my evaluations of any kind. You know, they want my teaching evaluations or my TA evaluations, whatever I had. I don't know if they actually looked at them or not, but lots of places asked for them. Yeah, so one thing, because a lot of places asked for your evaluations, um, one thing I wish I had done, so for those of you who are doing CCUT um, and have to write a summary of your evaluations, if I had had my stuff together beforehand, then a lot of places will actually not only accept your evaluations, but a, a, you know, a discussion of your evaluations. Um, so if I had, you know, done that sooner, then that would have been nice to have submitted that, rather than what I did was I just submitted the raw evaluations. 
Um, before I forgot about this, uh, I think Lisa is going to hate me because um, she's going to have a lot of work uh, in, in quiz. Um, but I think Lisa very, was very helpful, um, and we had a one-on-one -on -one consult, uh, consulting hours that she actually helped me to prepare my uh, lecture, like a sample lecture, and go over all, went over all of those um, uh, slides that I had, and tell tell me, you know, where to improve. So I think that's that's very important. Um, and for the four, four, four places, there's only actually one place ask for uh, the teaching evaluation because I missed the lecture time. Um, <laughs> but the rest, because they want you to give a sample lecture so they will see what are you going to do? And if you are, you know, interact with the students, and they also ask the student to give you evaluation for their mm -hmm. students, so they will have a form, so the student will, you know, give your feedback. So I think go to Lisa and do a consult. My door's wide open. <laughs> and they take appointments. Yeah. All right. I think we have time for two more questions, and I'm going to go here and then up front. Uh, thank you so much for doing this panel. Um, I'm sorry if you've already spoken about this, but I'm wondering when you applied for jobs, what was the kind of breakdown between teaching requirement and research? Like were some jobs here, we want you to mainly be a teacher, but maybe some research on the side, were some like dual, were some just solely teaching? Yeah, well, so again, I applied to a huge spectrum. So of course, community colleges don't generally expect you to do any research. Um, and then within the the, um, liberal arts colleges I applied to. So Wellesley, for instance, actually my visiting position, this one doesn't officially require that I do any research, but it is, um, you know, it's still a good idea to do research, especially if you want to get a full-time faculty position afterwards. And they definitely, I think the fact that I plan on doing research helped me to get that job, even though they don't require it. But then on the other hand of the spectrum, some of the other places like Bates, um, you know, expect you to do research, especially, I think, um, I mean, with undergraduates. So if you're applying to liberal arts colleges, you really need to think about how, what projects you could have that an undergraduate could do, which I do string theory, so that was really hard <laughs> <laughs> to say. <laughs> uh, yeah, from my point of view, um, yeah, I, I found that, you know, some places would say, oh, we're looking, this is a teaching position. And then you do the phone interview, and then they start asking you all about your research. And it's like, OK, what is it? So I think it's important to, when you go into the phone interview, get them to clarify what is their expectation for the amount of research and the amount of teaching that you're going to do. So yeah, but I, I mostly applied to like you know, these types of positions that said they were teaching focused. And it seemed that you know, they want you, like, you know, I applied to a lot of Cal State schools, for instance. They really care about teaching. And if you do research on top of that, that's great, but it's, it's more about the teaching. So that was my experience. Yeah, so for my job, they have been very clear that is 40%, uh, 40%, 20%, 40 which means that the uh, uh, research and teaching are this at the same weight. And they also have 20% uh, for community service. Um, so I guess that um, clarify the situation. So I still need to do research. Thank you. Um, so I feel like a lot of institutions often play lip service to being interdisciplinary or encouraging interdisciplinary work, but sometimes when it boils down to it, they're just really confused if you present yourself as multifaceted. <laughs> um, so I was just wondering if you could all speak to whether or not you felt like you had to put yourself in a box for given interviews. I think Cecilia briefly touched on this already. Or if you have some successful strategies as to how to market yourself as a truly interdisciplinary academic. Yeah, I guess that if you go to the R1, um, you want it to be really like deep and just I'm just I'm just going to do this, <laughs> nothing else. Um, um, but you know, if you kind of like to R2, this uh, or um, it is less uh, strict, so you can be more creative and you know count other things into your uh, your merit. Um, yeah, before, for, I, I don't know how the rest will work, yeah. Yeah, so, 
Uh, for me, yeah, I kind of had a similar experience. Like at a, you know, so I, I mentioned I wrote this kind of off-center research statement. And so when I had an interview at an R1 school, they asked me about it, and they said, you know, what's up with that? <laughs> and I didn't know how to answer the question. You know, it's like, should I say that I want to do like an interdisciplinary other stuff outside of computer science? Or should I say that I have this like specific you know, focus and I'm going to follow this one line to the end? Uh, so yeah, I mean, I didn't really know how to respond to that. But like at Harvey Mudd, uh, you know, I had already looked at you know, what, what the other faculty are doing. And uh, you know, like one professor teaches in computer science and theater, and another one teaches computer science and music. So I knew that it was okay to talk about all kinds of other stuff, and you know, talk about how it can be, you know, related to philosophy or whatever else I might be interested in. So there, it was okay. But our one school didn't seem to fly so well. Yeah. Again, I just agree with everything. That was definitely liberal arts colleges. I think. Um, so even though my research is specifically in physics, I consider myself to be pretty well-rounded. Like, so I openly told them, you know, I started college as a theater major. I had this like non-traditional background. I also minored in philosophy. I've done all sorts of things. And I think the liberal arts colleges, they really liked that. Yeah. All right. Well, thank our panelists so much. We can get one round of applause for our two panelists.